Get ready to hang on. This, this is an old one. There's no words up there, but please sing along. You know what? We call it the campfire medley, and it goes something like this. Oh, I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Oh do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. I said, I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. Oh, I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. Look away beyond the blue. Do Lord, I do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, look away beyond the blue. Well, I wandered so aimless, well, I filled with sin. Oh, I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. I said, praise the Lord, I saw. Y'all know this, sing along, here we go. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more for night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. I said, praise the Lord, I saw the light. Now just like a blind man, I wandered alone. For reason fears I cling for my own. The blind man that got me back to sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. I praise the Lord, I saw the light. Take it, Mike. Go ahead and put your hands together. Mm, Jimmy on the guitar. I told you we were going to wake up one way or another. And Donna on the piano. To praise the Lord, I saw the light. One more time, I said, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. To praise the Lord, I saw the light. And we're not done yet. Give me that whole time religion. Give me that whole time. Give me that old time religion is good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It's good enough for me. Give me that old old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good. One more time. Give me that. Old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Well, it is good to see you folks. I hope you've had a great week. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. How many fathers we got in here today? <laughs> Several. Yeah. Great to see you guys. And we are blessed, no doubt, to serve the ultimate Father. Amen. Amen. God our Father. And we just come to uh, bring him praise today, to honor him, and uh, 
just together to lift our voices and our, our minds, our spirits, and just to honor him in all that we do. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I pray that all that we do today will, will honor you. Thank you for being our Father. Abba, Father, we just cry out to you with all that we have. And just so thankful that we can. The love that you bring down from your throne, God, we just can't imagine. The power that's there just, just in the love that we share together. So from this moment on, God, it's not about me, but it's all about Jesus. And it's in his precious name we pray and God's people say, Amen. Amen. If you didn't wake up on the first one, I guarantee you will on this one, all right? The Lord reigns. There's part in this song that says, let the people shout. When we get to there, can we cry out a shout of praise? The Lord reigns, let the people shout. Hey, he reigns in righteousness. Let the heavens rejoice. The Lord reigns, let the people clap their hands. Angels shout, redeemed have come to dance, to celebrate, to celebrate. He reigns. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, and we will sing and shout. You reign, you reign. You reign forever, King of all. Forever, King of all. The Lord reigns, let the people shout praise. He reigns in righteousness. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice. Lord reigns, let the people clap their hands. Angels shout, redeemed have come to dance, to celebrate, to celebrate. He reigns. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, and we will sing and shout. You reign, you reign, you reign, forever King of all. King of all Let all the people sing of your awesome power and all the earth Let darkness tremble at your name Why do the nations rage when the King is on his throne? Now and forever you will reign. Let's sing it again. Let all the people sing of your awesome power and all the earth. Let darkness tremble at your name. Why do the nations rage when the king is on his throne? Now and forever you will reign. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, and we will sing and shout. You reign, you reign, you reign, forever King of all. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, and we will sing and shout. You reign, you reign. You reign, you reign forever king of all forever king of all can we crowd together the lord reigns ready the lord reigns amen let's give him the praise Take a moment, greet somebody, make them welcome. Tell a father, happy Father's Day.
I, what? It's not the entrance. We wasn't with the, uh, the, we didn't plan on the talking. I was like, put everyone up, I was like, not the right. No. Okay, I was kind of off. Hey, Jimmy. Sun that shines, awake my 
soul, awake my soul and sing. From the darkness comes a light. Awake my soul, awake my soul and sing. Like the rising sun that shines. Awake my soul, awake my soul and sing. Only you can raise a life Awake my soul Awake my soul and sing Oh, love of God, how rich 
through the heavens and fills the whole earth. We thank you for that today, God. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for the peace we have in our hearts because of your love. The love of a father to be willing to give up his son. Oh, Father, we cry, holy, holy, holy is your name. That's our prayer today, God, that you receive this time of worship, our thoughts, and all that's been done and is going to be done <coughs> to your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy. God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy. study of community, it was pointed out to us that we as Christians receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. Paul reminds us in Galatians 5, 28, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The communion service is prepared each week to help us be in a closer walk with God. Christ instituted this service when he said while they were eating Jesus took bread gave thanks and broke it 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he offered the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. From now on, until that day, I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus invites us to this table that he's prepared, not only for us to remember him, but to fellowship him, with him. While we remember his death by the loaf and the cup, we celebrate his resurrection by way of his presence here with us each week. Christ invites us to come in remembrance, fellowship with him, and walk out with the Holy Spirit singing, oh my, what a friend we have in Jesus. Father, we come to this table now at the invitation of your son who freely gave his body and his blood, Father. As we partake of these emblems today, may we remember that sacrifice. We remember that friendship that we have with your son only provided by his blood. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen.
Let us now all partake of the loaf in remembrance of Christ's broken body. Also the cup for his shed blood. Join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the ability to come to your house and worship you freely today without persecution. We just also thank you for your love for us and sending a, fa a Father to lead us and direct us in our lives to show us how to physically do things, but mainly to lead us to spiritually to your Son. Now, as we bring our tithes and offerings to you, <laughs> We ask you that the word can go out that your son went to the cross, died for our sins, went to be buried, was raised, and he is alive and well today. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In that, I got to do two weddings, one Friday night and one uh, last, last evening, and they were absolutely gorgeous weddings, one outdoors, one here at the church. The outdoor wedding, the weather was absolutely perfect. Uh, it was overcast and cool, uh, both simple weddings, uh, and in their simplicity, extremely beautiful. So. I just say that it's June, and we've uh, had a lot of weddings recently, but I want the church to know I've got to know and meet some of the grandest couples I think I've ever married this uh, spring and summer, and it's been, been a fun time. Next week, I think there's another wedding. I'm not sure. Um, it's a little small wedding where Joseph Redmond's getting married, and uh, there's great rejoicing in the Redmond household that somebody agreed to marry him. Uh, but anyway... Joseph, he's not here, he'll be here later, and I just want to rehearse insulting him. <laughs> Dad's Happy Father's Day. I don't know if you've ever noticed, and, and I want to say a few things just raw from my heart right now. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but on Mother's Day attendance is always up. Father's Day attendance is a little bit down. And I want to thank the dads that are here. Uh, we need men that will stand up as leaders of their homes and leaders of their households as we were singing a while ago about the needs of a nation. And I just want to thank the dads that were here. I stand in the pulpit because uh, uh, one of the major influences in my life was a father who passed away when I was young, but his influence was tremendous. Uh, in his faith, he and my mom's both, but in his faith, especially today as I speak. And I want to thank him, in absentia, obviously, but uh, to thank all the fathers that are here. I spoke to a dad just a few minutes ago when we were greeting each other and asked him if he's going motorcycle riding today, and he said, no, I'll be with my dad. But I think the witness is tremendous that he's here first, and saying uh, coming to worship is of tremendous importance. So Thank you, uh, dads, for being here. Listen to this scripture, and, and I say that, you know, quite often. Listen, stay with me, but I want you to listen to this scripture, and I'm not saying that as to pay attention. I'm saying, using a scriptural term, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Allow God to speak to you right now. Sam used this at the Lord's table. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Now let me read that again. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. The day you became a Christian, and this is a promise that's given to us in God's Word in Acts, second chapter. The day you became a Christian, you, you came repentant of sin, very important. You confessed Christ before men. You were buried with Him in baptism. 
The Apostle Peter says, when that happened, you received the Holy Spirit living in you. And we hear that all the time. But you received God living in you. And that means we begin to function and see things as Christ would see them. Now, here's a real quick one-word answer test. What have we been talking about the last two weeks and continue to talk about? Evangelism. Evangelism. Okay, please, everybody know that. What have we been talking about? Everybody say it before Larry Shropshire says it. What have we been talking about? Evangelism. Okay. And I want us to really hold on to that. And hopefully we've talked about broadening that circle of love. We've talked about um, that it's about uh, love of God and people. It's the best definition of evangelism I could put together in my heart. And I hope that you have that one person you're, you're thinking about. If the Holy Spirit is living in us, that's how we begin to think. We were in a, a restaurant with uh, our children. And... They had behaved beautifully. We'd set a record. And then on the way out dancing around, they barely brushed against a lady. There was no harm, no foul type thing. But we made the decision, you need to apologize to her. You need to apologize. Well, as soon as we said, you're going to go to that lady and apologize, one of them sat down and said, I need to tie my shoe. And the other one, I apologize a little. I, you know. And I made him go apologize. Well, I watched him, and he just skipped by and came back in the restaurant and said, I, I apologized. Well, that didn't end well because he had not apologized. That's not the point of the story. Had ended. I would have been arrested had the right people seen it, but it, it didn't end that way. But I wonder how many of us are that way about evangelism? How many of us are that way about evangelism? I need to tie my shoe first. I need to, to learn a few more things. Um, it's just not that important to me. I want to tell you a couple of stories, true stories. I ask you to have one person in mind. Well, I had opportunity with the person I had in mind for conversation this week. And the person and I sat down and talked, and there were tears. There was no conversion, but there were tears. And we've agreed to talk again. So I felt like God is guiding this, things are going well. Well, just a few minutes later, literally a few minutes later, I was in a business. And I want to share a true story, but I feel like the Holy Spirit was governing me. You've got to be open to people's needs. And, and I was in the business, and the gentleman I was talking to seemed to be real sleepy, yawning a lot. And, and I said, you, you seem to be sleepy. Is everything okay? And he said, um, not really, I've not been sleeping at night. And we talked a few more minutes, and I stopped what we were talking about, and I said, let me, let me interrupt you. I just would like to, to tell you if there's anything I can help you with, I would love to help you with whatever's going on. I, I'm a Christian, and if that's okay, I'd just love to be able to help you with whatever's going on. This is in a business. Keep in mind, just people you meet, people I meet every day. I think the Holy Spirit guides this. And he said, no, that's, that's okay, but I really appreciate it. He said, it's physical. And I said, okay. So I immediately thought, what? Some horrible disease in his family or with him. And we talked a few more minutes, and then he said, I appreciate a lot that you ask if you could help me as a Christian. He said, I'm going to tell you what's wrong. He said, I ate a can of almonds about that tall and that big around three days ago. And they have so stopped me up, I'm not sleeping at night. Now, I wouldn't tell you that story other than that's the truth. Okay? And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I cannot believe this is, I'm on candid camera. You know? And we kept talking and went on, and I felt funny about it. And then the next day... I had to be in the business again, and another person was talking to me. I looked and didn't see my friend, and he came out in a minute, and he said, How are we doing, buddy? I said, Good. I'm doing good. How are you doing? He said, I'm doing a lot better. <laughs> and then he said, What time and services at your church? Now, evangelism is the Holy Spirit guiding us to see the need 
to share our faith. And it doesn't always turn out the way we think it will. You see my point? It doesn't always turn out the way we think it will. But it nevertheless ends up being able to say, could I help you as a Christian? Could I show you, literally is what we're saying, how much God cares about you? God loves people. We're to love people and to love God. Now, that's evangelism. I, I titled the sermon today, Who Am I? And it seems to me there's three people, three people involved in, in this whole discussion of evangelism, three entities, if I could say it that way. There is God, who you are not, and I am not. There's the non-believer, who you may be or may not be. And there is the believer, the person that I'm addressing that needs to be aware of evangelism. Now, I'm asking the question, which one are you today? And as, as we talk about it, we won't look at all three of them in the scriptures, but as we talk about it, I want you to, to listen close. We're going to read several scriptures. First couple, first two or three, talk about non-believers. I want you to understand who non-believers are. They should um, be on the screen, but I'm going to ask you, if you would, take the time to turn to them also. First one's found in Ephesians, the second chapter. Um, verses 1 and 2, Ephesians 2, um, verse 1 and 2. Listen what is said from God's word about a non-believer. As for you, this is talking when we're non-believers, or, or maybe we say we're believers but we're unwilling to commit to Christ for whatever reason, um, we're, we're smarter than uh, too smart to do that, we think, or we know the truth, or, or you know, we're just being rebellious is what it amounts to. And it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work, and those who are disobedient. That's talking about Satan, evil. Okay? But look what it says. When you're living that way, you are dead in your sins. I tried to think of a thousand illustrations. But let me give you in, in its simplicity what it says about a person who is not a believer. And I'll come back and make a point with all of this in a minute. But a person who is not a believer, they are a walking corpse. They're just waiting to die. And then there will be the second death that the scripture warns us of multiple times. And the tradition of the church has taught us for several thousands of years. There is the reality of the walking dead. Nothing to live for except the next day. No hope for any day after that. Listen how he says it. As for you, you were dead. You were dead. That's the non-believer. I want you to see, and, and I did this on purpose, to look at some different letters written to different churches. Turn, if you will, to 2 Corinthians. Second letter written to the church at Corinth, the fourth chapter. And I want us to read verses 3 and 4. Now, we've talked about the non-believer, someone who is dead. There's no hope. And then listen what is said here. And even if our gospel, gospel means what, somebody? Good news. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the Son of God. That's the gospel. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The non-believer, right? The God of this age, God little g, meaning Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the good news that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. We use this phrase on Sunday morning, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. Next verse says, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what we believe as Christians. You believe it or you don't. There's no in between. You believe it or you don't. Okay? But it says, if you're not 100% sold out to Christ, then you're walking dead and you are blind. It would be the non-believer. Now, let's go on to one other scripture, 1 Corinthians first letter that was written to a church that was having all sorts of problems internally. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and the 14th verse. Listen what it says. 
the person without the Spirit, now that, you, you don't receive the Spirit until you've accepted Christ. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolish and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. This says a non-believer looks at the, the, the holy message, the love-filled message, the joyful message of Christ coming for us, and says, ah, oh, that's foolish. I don't need anything to do with that. It's said in a more difficult and straightforward way in other places in the Scriptures, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if there is no God and we get to decide if we're going to live in faith in God or faith in something else, it's, it's all about faith. We're not so smart we have it all figured out. But we decide in faith, if there is no God, there is no hope. That's the bottom line. You cannot have a faith that has any hope if there is no eternity. If there is no resurrection, you're going to die. So we, we you know, that's, that's what we deal with. And so it seems like it's a no-brainer. That's why it says the foolish person can understand this and will not accept it. Now, let me, let me say one other thing. If, if you have opportunity to accept Christ and your heart is compelled to do so, that is the grace of God working on you. It's, it's not all about, hey, I'll do it sometime. I'll, I'll buy it sometime. I'll go purchase it sometime. Uh, that's not who Jesus is, and that's not what it's all about. It is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Scripture tells us. He comes to convict. And if we've quenched the Holy Spirit, and we keep saying no, no, no to God, he'll leave us alone. And I pray to God we're not in that position, any of us. Now, don't hear that as a shotgun blasted. Everybody, boy, you've waited. No, I'm just, if you're dealing with that, you're the person that's dealing with that right now, and you're thinking to yourself, today is the time. And I'm going to beg you right now. We're going we're to uh, come to an invitation in just a few minutes, but I want to beg you at that time to accept Christ. Do not keep putting it off because there's no guarantees. Uh, again, now, take all of that we've said about the non believers. And let me shift gears a second and give you some real good excuses to never evangelize. I'm going to give you some excuses to never evangelize because we're looking for them. Okay? So let me give you um, one. Here's the first one. Boy, I agree with you, preacher. You know, I told you all, I think, one time about going to a Bible study of, and leading. There were a handful of women asked me to do a Bible study years ago. And, and I was doing the Bible study. And the first time we got together, I said, what do you want to accomplish this Bible study? You remember, I told you that one lady said, I want to be able to tell a joke. She wanted in that Bible study, and it was a real important thing to her, be able to tell a joke. So we worked through this Bible study, and believe it or not, taught her to tell a joke at the same time. She went home, told her husband, said he laughed, it's great. She came out of her shell. She's a professional comedian. No, I'm lying about that. <laughs> okay. But let me give you some excuses. Can you say I want to evangelize, but I, I, I can't. Now, here, here's one of the big excuses. Evangelism is not my gift. You know, I like to see people wander to Christ, but evangelism's not my gift. Let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Scripture does it say evangelism is a gift. Nowhere. It lists gifts, but it never calls evangelism a gift. Evangelism is what you do. You just decide it's that important to me that my neighbor or my family member not spend eternity in hell. It's that important to me, and it's that important to me that I express my love for them through God. It's just not a gift. Quit saying I don't have that gift. I remember as a young preacher the first time I ever knocked on a door because that's what we were supposed to do in that day, and my knees were shaking. I'm sure the guy that came to the door thought, what is wrong with this man? Bring him in and feed him. And it went real well when he came to the door and said to me, what do you want, son? It's not a gift. It's tough. But love is tough. And you won't go win somebody to Christ in 30 minutes. 
We've tried to convince people you win them in 30 minutes. You won't. It will take you living the gospel of Christ and speaking the gospel of Christ so that over a period of time, that foolish person begins to see. That blind person begins to see. That dead person begins to come to life and say, there's some hope there they're expressing. So don't sit here and say, I can't do it. I don't have that gift. You've got the gift of the Holy Spirit living in you if you're a Christian. What more do you want? That's God living in you. Now, let me give you another excuse. And, I, and I'm going to warn you. When I read this, don't anybody say amen or nod your head that you agree with it. Please don't. Okay? But St. Francis of Assisi said, and this, this is how we read it in Scripture, but he supposedly said, Preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. And everybody, oh, that's so good. That is so good. And I'll tell you why we think that's good, because we use it as an excuse. I don't have to say anything about Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of things about that statement. Preach the gospel when necessary, or use words if necessary. Why everybody loves that statement. It gives us a great excuse, but listen to this real close. First of all, St. Francis of Assisi never said that. Don't really believe everything that you read on the Internet. Somebody put it on there and said, oh, who do I want to put that to? And everybody think I'm cool. And it went viral. He did not say that. And you listen real close. That is nowhere in the Scripture. Nowhere in the Scripture. Um, I want you to listen to some things that are said in the scripture and I'm going to warn the booth a lot of these are going to come out of order but Matthew 24 14 Jesus said the gospel will be proclaimed and call me ignorant but proclaimed means spoken okay and Acts 5 42 says they continued to proclaim and Acts, the 8th chapter and the 5th verse, is that one up? It says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. Who was Philip? Philip was just the guy that the Scripture tells us in Acts 6 was full of God's Spirit. It doesn't say he was a gifted orator. He just somebody that said, when I go to get my hair cut, I want to leave here with them knowing that I love Jesus. When I sit down at, at dinner with my family, I want them to know I'm somebody that loves the Lord. And over a period of time, you'll begin to win people to Christ. Now, there's a new statistic that's being used in church growth because the statistic's always been how many were there on Sunday. But you know what they've learned? Listen to this. Preachers lie. Now, I promise you we don't with our statistics. But I am amazed some of the numbers of churches that I know have 120, and it'll say 500 in any literature to send out. They've counted everybody that's ever attended that church in the last 29 or 30 years. But you know a statistic that's being looked at now for true church growth is how many people are being baptized into Christ by that church per 10 that attend. See what I'm saying? You think if 10 people got together, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If 10 people right here got together and started praying and said, we want to win one person to Christ this year, that those 10 could identify somebody, pray for them, end up sharing the gospel with them, and win them to Christ. Well, they can't if they believe St. Francis of Assisi's line quote. And they can if all 10 of them got together and said, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so... I'll just go to the picnics the church have and call that worship. Where's your heart? Where's your heart for that person that I ask you to be thinking about that you want to be one to Christ? Where's your heart? Second Corinthians five eighteen. We're going back. I'm going to ask you to put that one on the screen a few slides back. 
talking about the gospel and everything, it says all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself. It means you were separated when you became a Christian. He brought you. So far, so good. We like that part. And then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I'm now to bring somebody to know God. They may refuse God, but I'm now to bring somebody I know to God. Jill and I and, and several others here from the church were on one of our mission trips to Haiti, and we came back in to the uh, airport and had gone through customs, and we are going from one gate to another to make our flight. We got a little bit of time, and, and you had to go out of the airport, get on a bus, and go to the next gate, uh, Miami Airport. And so we come out, we get on the bus, and we got on the wrong bus. Um, there were two young ladies that had been on the plane with us, and they got on the same bus. We were all on the wrong bus. We needed to go about a five-minute ride, and we ended up about a 40-minute ride. I kid you not on this bus. It went to every parking lot in Miami. Several didn't have anything to do with the airport. And we rode around on this bus, and if you've ever been on an airport bus, it's, it's got all the area in the back where they throw your luggage and then some seats, and then the seats up front, you're facing each other. And we were sitting, nice, comfortable seats, and right across from us were these two young ladies, and we'd noticed they were in the seats in front of us in the planes. We knew they'd come from Haiti, and, and we said something about that, and we began to talk to each other. And these two, um, two young girls began to tell us about their trip to Haiti, and in the conversation, very pretty young girls, sisters. And uh, they said, could we have your Facebook address? And Jill and I said, sure. And we gave them our Facebook address, and we got theirs. And they just loved Haiti and told us all about how much they loved the Lord and everything when they found out what we'd been doing. And so we got on their Facebook with them. We get a Facebook message from them at least once a day, at least once a day. And every single one of them, this has been going on for a year and a half, two years, every single one of their Facebook messages have been asking us to buy a skincare product. Wow. Are trying to encourage us to become one of their partners in selling skincare products. And so we get these Facebook messages showing their mother receiving her car for having sold so much skincare product. We got a picture from them a couple of days ago that their mom and the two girls laying on the beach. And I said, Well, Jill, it's vacation time. It's not. She said, No, read it. Enjoying the beach and the trip we won from selling the face or skincare product. Now, let me tell you, I don't question their faith. That's not what I'm saying. I know their passion. Man, their passion. And you talk about being blind and dead is to worship skin. What's your passion? I hope your passion right now is that person I ask you to think about. That person that needs to be reconciled to God. And the parameters we set for that person, is there a family member? They're a friend? Or maybe it's myself. And I want a faith in God. It was a man that went to Jesus and said, would you pray for my unbelief? I hope that's your passion. And it was difficult this past week to talk to who I talked to. But I realized God placed them in my heart, not somebody else's. People, get over it's easier for the preacher than it is for me. It is no easier for anybody else than it is for you. No harder, no easier. It's just, is it your passion? What do we need to do to be saved, Peter? You need to repent. Confess Christ and repent. You'll be buried with him in baptism. That's the imitation, death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. He asked us to do that. 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Reconciliation. Oh, it'll go great sometimes. Other times, you'll talk to somebody that ate too many almonds. But you know, God can be glorified in anything, can he? We're going to sing, and if there's a decision that needs to be made, please listen. We do an invitation every week. I'm begging you, on behalf of Christ, I'm begging you to make that decision. Please don't delay in any decision that needs to be made. I'm begging you, on behalf of Christ, on behalf of the church, please, 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 if God is working in your heart now, see that work fulfilled as you come to know him. Let's stand and we'll sing. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet. Of Jesus, the greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry. First of all, if you're visiting with us today, uh, David would love the opportunity just to meet you. So if you would just go out this way and to your left and into the library, he'll be there. And secondly, uh, any middle school parents and kids that are going on the mission trip tomorrow, uh, Andrew needs to meet with you right out here in the central lobby right after church. So if, if middle school parents or kids are going on the trip tomorrow, uh, be sure and meet Andrew out here. Let's pray. God, fill our hearts with a passion for lost people. God, you are holy. You fill our lives with your holiness. And Father, we pray that we too might be holy as you are holy. God, we know this is serious. And so we just pray that you will give us the courage and the strength and the passion for lost souls this week. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Remember me, oh, do not
Jesus.